Dan is very kind to me, and I appreciate that. Appreciate you being here. The lunch hour is not always the most conducive to staying awake or paying close attention. I remember when I was at Brown Trail, we had a teacher that came in to teach the class, and it was a lunch afternoon uh, class right after the lunch hour, and we were sitting at long tables. Uh, we didn't have a setup similar to what we have at MSOP. Uh, and as we were sitting there, we were studying Greek. We were parsing a chapter out of Second Timothy, I think it was, and uh, he looked down at his text and he said, now let's take a close look at the passage and let's just meditate for a minute on what this verb means or what this noun means. And he was very quiet. And we looked at, up at the head of the table and he had his hands up like this and he was doing this. <laughs> <laughs> he was shocked when he, he jerked his head and he said, how long have I been asleep? And we said, you've been asleep for 45 minutes <laughs> when it had only been a couple of moments. I think probably all of us uh, today uh, have some fond memories of Brother Taylor. And he has always been a great influence in my life. Uh, the first time that I heard him speak was in 1974 at the Freed Hardeman Lectures. And he gave me a challenge, gave all of us in the auditorium a challenge. He said uh, he typically would read the New Testament through once a month. And I got to looking at my Bible. I still have my uh, same platform or same plates in the New American Standard Translation that I had back then. And there's 288 pages in this New Testament. That means if I read 10 pages a day, I would finish up in 29 days. And so I present to all of you who are young preachers, older preachers, uh, that you try that. 1974, when I first heard that, uh, I did not achieve the goal of once a month. But from 1976 on, I've, I've done that every month, read through the New Testament, and it's, it's a great way to study. It'll fixate things in your mind that otherwise uh, you may be ten, uh, tempted or tend, tend to forget. He will be sorely missed, but as so many have uh, recognized, he and Irene now are reunited, and along with all of those great preachers who have gone on before and the great work they've done. Uh, this passage in Matthew chapter 2 is a, it's a popular passage, and even a novice Bible student uh, knows what's in this passage. Uh, he's heard the story of the wise men, from uh, many of them from the time they were little children. The story's been embellished by Hollywood and uh, by media and others, traditional uh, things that have been said about the wise men that simply are not true. There's no way you could prove those things. We do know there was at least at least two, and uh, there's no way you could uh, determine whether there was three or not, even if your life depended on it. But the, the theme of this lectureship is a great theme in that it helps me to understand the great value of wisdom. And this is not the first lectureship to address the subject of wisdom. The Power Lecture several years ago had a series on the sayings of Solomon, which basically was wisdom literature. And uh, you would do well to dig that out and study it if you're going to study, do a serious study of, of wisdom. But the Western world seems to be moving away from God rather than drawing closer to God. And the more we move away from God, the less our ability to reason and think properly. We live in a world that's just not thinking. They're, they're not even using common sense anymore. They don't seem to be able to produce the kind of quality even in the work that they do. Uh, I ordered a four by eight piece of plywood several months ago. We were doing some work around the house. And so I ordered it online so it would be ready when I went to the, well, I'm not going to tell you the name of the company. <laughs> I don't want to discourage you, <laughs> but when I went to pick it up, I went in down at the contractor's area, and they said, you need to go up to the uh, pickup orders, 
where you pick up the order that you've ordered online. So when I got there and I checked in, I gave the lady my slip of paper and had the order number on this, and she commenced to look in little cubicles right behind her. Couldn't have been more than 12 inches by 15 inches. Now she's looking for a four by eight piece of plywood. And I said, ma'am, this is a four by eight, a four by eight piece of plywood. I didn't think she heard me at first, and I, so I repeated it. It's not going to be in any of those cubicles, ma'am. It's a four by eight piece of plywood. She said, I know, but we have to check the numbers with every cubicle till we find it. I said, ma'am, it's not going to be in any of those cubicles. Well, she finally went to the computer, looked the number up, and she said, well, it's not going to be up here. <laughs> she said, you need to go back to the contractor section. So I went back there, and they said, no, you need to go to the pickup order. And I said, let's just cancel the order. <laughs> and I went home, and I canceled it, and I went back at a later day. The only reason I share that story with you is that it is a manifestation of how men who reject God and the divine wisdom that comes from above has a rippling effect on every aspect of our life. Several of the speakers have pointed out, in fact, that, um, that there has to be the application of wisdom. And April wrote out the word W-I-S-D-O-M, wisdom. In the middle of that are the two letters D-O, do. There's a practical application in that. Uh, I could very easily spend a lot of time in Romans chapter 1 where the Apostle Paul talks about the deterioration of the Gentile world. And you're familiar with verses 18 and following where he wrote the words that even though God had revealed Himself to them through the natural, just the natural things about us, that the invisible things of God are clearly seen by the things which are made. That man then rejected that belief in God and chose to serve the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. And because of that, they could no longer reason properly. You're seeing that played out in the stages of the Western world now. Who in their right mind would think, I mean, just logically speaking, that somehow defunding authorities and police departments is going to lead to a more stable society? Common sense tells you where it's going to take you. And has that not proven to be the case now in the last uh, 12 or 14 months? And those places who did not use wisdom on that occasion have now realized the foolishness of the choices that they made, and yet they still continue to demonstrate a tremendous lack of wisdom in so many areas. Let me just give you a quick overview of Matthew chapter 2, and then I want to go back through it. and uh, We're going to basically look at the text itself and introduce ourselves to several characters in this text, and then we're going to draw out some practical application uh, as to why these men that we sometimes call the wise men from the East, why these men could very properly be considered men of great wisdom. Here were men who were seeking the truth. They were looking for God. I don't know how they came to understand that this star would lead them to the Messiah or who, exactly who that Messiah was. There's so much we'd like to know about these men that we just don't know. But when you look at the chapter, you're introduced to the wise men, you're introduced to Herod and several other characters as you move through the story itself. But the, the focus for the purpose of this lesson is going to be on verses 1 through about 16. And when I, look at, when I just look at the passage and I start reading, uh, this is not in the manuscript because this did not dawn on me until later. Had I thought about this, I would have included at least some part of the manuscript to discuss this point. When you look at each of these characters that we come across in this remarkable story, there are verbs that are attached to each one of them and what they did in the process as the story unfolds. And I would challenge you just spend some time 
in chapter 2 and look at some of the verbs that are attached to the characters. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit as we focus here on the text. I want you to look at verse 1 with me for just a moment. Now, when Jesus was born, the story itself begins. It's not a make-believe story. It's a real story. But look at the verb that's attached to the character Jesus. He was born. That was not the beginning of His existence. Jesus is divine. And His history reaches far beyond even the existence of history. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Everything that was made, He has made. And almost as if that were not enough, John then says, And without Him was not anything made that hath been made. Jesus was born. He was born in fulfillment of prophecy, as mentioned back in chapter 1. He was born in the fullness of time. If you're not a history student, I don't think you can really appreciate that as greatly as you could if you spent some time studying Roman history and Grecian history. The uh, first opportunity I had after graduating from Brown Trail, I attended East Central University, and I majored, well, attempted, I never finished the degree. I wanted to get a major in history and speech. And in that uh, history major, you had to have either Roman history or Grecian history. And I completed the Roman history, and then I wanted to take Grecian history, and my Advisor said, you don't have to study Grecian history. You had that, made that element in the history of Rome. I said, you don't understand. It's not that I have to, I want to. But as you study the history of the world, you see the amazing unfolding of God's great scheme of redemption. And you walk away from that with a deeper appreciation of God's interaction with humanity. God did not wind this world up and throw it out there and said, now just you take care of yourself until the clock runs down and I send my son again. That's not how God interacts with His people. So Jesus was born. He was born according to, history, to, to prophecy. He was born in the fullness of time. And here was a world that was expecting and looking for some great Redeemer that was coming. Their knowledge was limited, obviously, and even the Jews had a limited knowledge of this Messiah who would come. It was warped because they wanted a physical king to come. And that physical king was never promised in the Old Testament. And so Jesus was born. He was born in the fullness of time. He was born into this world to serve as our Savior. And there's that vital connection between His, His Messiahship and the expectation of a great King that was coming that played a, uh, an important part in these wise men and what they did. We'll see that as we go through the text. Look at the next couple of phrases in the passage. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, house of bread. It's the meaning of that word. The bread of life was born in the house of bread. We can follow, a, chase a rabbit there, follow another trail, and talk about Jesus being the bread of life, but we don't have time for that. Look at something else. In the days of Herod, that's all Matthew had to tell us. That speaks volumes. Herod was, uh, Herod the Great, well, even Herod Agrippa and, and Herod Antipas, all of them were wicked rulers. Their life is filled with uh, uh, incidences of adultery, murder, intrigue. Uh, Herod the Great uh, killed his, his own wife, had her put to death, some of his children. And all you had to do was hint that you disagreed with Herod the, Gr Herod the Great, and you could pretty well number your days. It wouldn't be long till you found yourself in the same position of some of his kinfolk. That never changed in the Herodian family. 
But when Matthew says he was born in the days of Herod, that says to me it was not the most convenient of times to travel looking for some other king. Are you beginning to see the connection between the wise men and even the day, the age, the time in which Jesus was born in which they made that journey? Look at the next verse over in verse, well, the last part of verse 1. Wise men from the east came. You're going to pick up verbs like they came, they asked, they inquired, they offered their gifts, they departed as it closes toward the end of verse 12, they departed a different way. Verbs that are connected with this group of men, the magi is the word that's actually used there. The magi were uh, men of uh, official positions, uh, men of wisdom supposedly in the uh, Babylonian Empire and running over into this day and age, but uh, uh, they would maybe correspond to our modern day astrologers. Uh, but that doesn't mean that great men who were magi, big godly men who were magi, were affected by the superstitions of the class of magi. Daniel was the president of this class of people. They had great responsibility. They would appear before the king and give advice to the king, and so they were very influential. And no doubt, as we read the story here, they were very wealthy as, as well. And then I come across another interesting group in the text, and these are the chief priests and the scribes in verse 4. You know, each one of these groups represents a certain attitude toward Christ even today. Herod represents those who are opposed openly, antagonistic toward God and Christ, and they may best be described by the term used in Psalm chapter 1, "'Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffer, and raises their fist in the face of God. They hate God. Herod was just such an individual. But the scribes and the Pharisees represent those who are somewhat indifferent. And this is sort of a paradox here, because here were men who knew the Scriptures. They were the religious leaders of their day and age. And, and here come the wise men. They come in contact with the chief priests and the scribes. And I talked, you know, we talked about verbs attached to each one of these groups. I don't see any of that in the scribes and the Pharisees. They just answered the in inquiry. I suggest to you that this group of men, the scribes and the Pharisees, chief scribes and the Pharisees, represent those who are just sort of indifferent. So what? They should have been the ones looking for the Messiah with all the knowledge they had of the Scripture, but they didn't seem to care. And uh, so they were sort of indifferent toward all of that. Well, the wise men continue their journey. You remember the story. By the way, this star was not some normal appearance of some bright star out in the west that they followed. This is a star that was miraculous in its nature. It came and stood over the place where the child was at. Now, just... Just use a little bit of observation. If you go out and you look at a star off in the distance, let's say it's ten times as bright as any other star, and you start walking toward that star, and you arrive at some destination, where's that star going to be? It's still going to be out there. It's not going to stand over any particular place. This was in a miraculous leading of God for these wise men to follow. And we're going to learn some things about these wise men in just a moment that helps me to appreciate why they're called wise men. Magi, yes. Astrologers, yes. Advisors to the king, yes. But our English translations four times in this passage use the word wise. Now we've heard all kinds of lessons already and even lessons with subpoints in them that wisdom, knowledge of God is the beginning of wisdom. So the English translator saw in this intellectual men who evidently had a religious uh, element in their life, and they were seeking this particular, this particular truth. And so you've got these wise men. They represent 
people who are searching. The title of this lesson, Wise Men Still Seek Him. Seeking God is not exclusive to these wise men. It's not exclusive to any class of men. Every time I read the word seek in the Scriptures with reference to searching after God, the word that's used in the New Testament is a word that describes seeking with the expectation of finding. They're looking for something. They're searching it out. There was a gentleman back in the 1960s who he and his wife and his children and a crew of men, they... They started looking for the old Spanish ship, the Atoka. And for 16 years, they searched. They searched. And they were diligent in that search, and it paid off. And eventually, they found the Atoka, and its treasure was worth more than $100 million. You know the passage about the one who sought for the pearl at great price. Wise men still seek Him. And we're going to see some things about these wise men that helps me to appreciate uh, what they did. And if I take the same lessons and I apply those to my life, these principles, then I will be classified as someone who's wise and someone who's going to be rewarded. God always says, if you seek, you will find. Matthew 7 hasn't changed. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Do you see the expectation in this? Seeking with the expectation of finding. So let's think about these wise men then, and let's see if we can come up with some principles that help me appreciate why they're called wise. I'm going to suggest to you, first of all, that they did not allow their circumstances to impede their journey. They did not allow their circumstances to impede their journey. We live in an age today that uh, nobody wants to take the blame. You know, it's Trump's fault, it's the Democrats' fault, it's the Republicans' fault, it's my wife's fault, it's my husband's fault. There was a case back in the 1970s, I think it was, where a man murdered the mayor of Los Angeles. And uh, he took a defense that's came to be known as the Twinkie defense. Y'all remember that? And basically the argument of the defense lawyer was, well, my client ate too many Twinkies that weekend. And so his chemical imbalance, you'll be thankful to know that did not stand in court. I'm wondering if it would stand today if people use that. But he used the Twinkie defense. Uh, and basically it was an argument, I'm not responsible for what I've done. Circumstances in my life are such that I don't have to answer for that. That's as old as history. Look at Moses and Aaron when Moses confronted Aaron about the golden calf. Well, you look at the <laughs> look at the defense he made. Well, you know the the people. That's the people, and they gave me all this gold and I put it in the fire and this calf came out <laughs> as if it just popped out of the fire by itself. He'd been a lot better off if he'd have said, I sinned, Moses, and I crafted the cab. But it he, he was an attempt to escape responsibility. Saul comes back from the battle with the Amalekites. God had said to Saul, you go destroy all the Amalekites, men, women, children, animals, everything. And he, he spares King Agag. And when he comes back, uh, Samuel meets Saul. And Samuel, amazingly enough, blinded to his own foolishness, he said, I've done the will of the Lord. And Samuel says, what, what's, what is this I hear? You remember how, how Saul answered? It was the people. It's the people. Let's go all the way back to the first couple, Adam and Eve. The audacity of Adam to blame God in all of this. And say, it's the woman you gave to me. Well, she passed the buck. She said, it's the servant. Or as one old brother in South Africa once said, he said, Adam blamed the woman, the woman blamed the snake, the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> but shifting the blame is as old as history. Here were men who had unusual circumstances in their life. I want you to think about a couple of these. And then think about these in relation to how they acted. 
they had a great distance to travel, a thousand miles or more. They'd have to go up through that upper region and come down into Israel. If they could manage 15 miles a day, if they could even manage that, it would have taken two months for them to get there, two months to get back. But they did not allow that circumstance to impede their journey. Think about something else. They were going into a country that was hostile to their very existence. They're Gentiles. They're heathens. They worship pagan gods. How do you think they would have been treated when they arrived in the land of Canaan? And here was the Jewish nation who still hated the Gentile world. So you see, they had a lot of things challenging them. What about their responsibilities as magi? These were not men who had easy jobs. They had great responsibility. So here were men who did not allow the circumstances in life to impede their journey. A person who is seeking God, as the title suggests here, is a person who's making a journey. And so many times people get distracted by the complications of getting from point A to point B. I don't have the knowledge. Uh, my family gets in the way. My job gets in the way. The excuses are endless. But these men were wise because they did not allow their circumstances and life to impede their journey. Let me give you a second character trait. And that is they did not allow their calling to interfere with their priorities. Their calling was their occupation. And uh, I'm glad that several of the speakers have made a difference, have pointed out the difference between our vocation and our occupation. Paul said our vocation is to serve Christ. We're to walk worthily of the vocation wherewith we were called. I can remember when I was in high school, we had a career day. And you would have people come in from the fire department, doctors, uh, trying to persuade young graduating students what vocation they wanted to pursue. And I, I'm thankful that I was raised in a godly home because I already knew that my vocation in life was to serve God. Occupation supports our vocation. And the difficulty is, is when we get those two confused. And all of a sudden our occupation becomes our vocation and Christianity simply becomes a part of my overall life instead of the essence of my life. We studied Ecclesiastes 12 on numerous occasions in this series of lectures. Here are the conclusion of the whole, a whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole of man, the whole duty of man. That's your vocation. Your occupation supports that. So it seems to me that when you look at your options for your occupation, you ought to choose an occupation that enhances your vocation. And yet so many times, this generation is growing up with the dollar signs in their eyes and the trinkets of the world drowning out the sound of God's invitation for him. And if you're going to choose an occupation, I would recommend, young people, that you not choose an occupation that's going to take you away from God. It can be a direct, an occupation that is directly opposed to God into some field of work that is ungodly. Or it can be an occupation that very subtly takes you away from God. I had a lady several years ago in the congregation where I was laboring. Uh, she had divorced her husband for scriptural grounds. And uh, she was struggling just to make ends meet. And she met with the elders one day, and I met with them as well. She said, I have an opportunity for a great paying job. The problem is it's going to take me away from services three weeks out of the month. And I told her, I said, don't take the job. God will open another door if you'll prove yourself to be faithful. She took the job. Within six months, she completely left the church. Completely. In contrast to that, in the same congregation, there was a gentleman who 
When I moved there, he was involved in a video rental place. And you know what kind of garbage those have. There was a little section in this video rental that had what we would call soft porn. And I said, Ron, you don't have any business working in this place. And I'd go by and encourage him to, to quit. I'd say, just resign. He said, Brother Tom, I don't know what I would do for income. I went in one Friday and I said, Ron, I said, give your keys to your boss tonight. Just resign. God will open up a door for you. Sunday morning, he came up to me and shook my hand. He said, I did it. I said, you did what? He said, I resigned. I said, have you got a job? He said, no. I don't know what I'm going to do. Monday morning, he got an invitation from a local bank for a job to begin. It's a, it's a success story. <laughs> to begin in the basement delivering mail to all the different rooms in the building. Last time I talked to him, he had been advanced to the manager of the mail distribution department. And he was a faithful, godly man. You see, our occupation has to support our vocation, but our vocation is serving God. And these men were wise because they didn't allow their calling to interfere with priorities. And the key word here is the word priorities. There's a movie in the, uh, in the Walt Disney line of animated movies. I'm not recommending Disney for anything anymore. In fact, I would suggest it's time to just Forget Disney. Totally. Don't support them. But there was a movie called The Lion King. Do you remember that? And the theme song in that movie, the lyrics went something like this. From the time we arrive on this planet and blinking, eyes blinking, step into the sun, there's more to, more to see than can ever be seen, more to do than can ever be done. You're never going to read every book in this world. You can't. It's, it's impossible. I've tried it. It doesn't work. <laughs> I have an ongoing list. It's not time. Go sit back down. I have an ongoing list of books I want to read. I have 90 right now, maybe 99 in line to be read. You're not going to see everything there is to be seen. You have to choose. So why not choose the things that are important? Here's the third character trait. They demonstrated a character that illustrates people of God. Character. There's at least five or six things in their character traits that I want to touch on. At least a, a, a couple of them, two or three of them. One of these is they were noble in that they sought. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. First Thessalonians, uh, uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Nobility is not based on wealth or riches. It's based on what you desire in life. These men were seeking, where is, where is the king of Israel? They wanted to find him. Here's another character trait. They knew they needed guidance. What's wrong with with admitting, I need guidance from God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What's wrong with admitting we need guidance? But look at a third character trait. Not only did they recognize they need guidance, that when the guidance was given to them, they submitted to it. It's good advice, they submitted to it. Man walks into the doctor's office, he gets an examination, he's going out, the receptionist says that'll be $40. He said, what for? She says, the doctor's advice. He said, I'm not going to take the doctor's advice. <laughs> you might be able to get by that with the doctor. You're not going to get by with, it, with God. They knew they needed advice. And then they were generous in what God had given to them. We're not told how much wealth they had, but they had to have been wealthy. But they opened up their treasures and they gave to God. That made them wise. One last character trait of these men, this is still under the fact that they demonstrated a character that illustrates people of God, and that is they stayed at it until they finished the task. Can you imagine the obstacles they must have faced in that journey? 
Can you imagine the ridicule they must have gotten from their fellow magi before they packed up? Said, we're going to Israel. Are you out of your mind? What are you going to do with your responsibilities? But they stayed with it. They made the journey all the way to the end. I want you to look at a verse, verse 12, if you will. And I know this is a physical, it's a physical uh, statement. But there is in this, I think, a, a great play on words. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country. Look at these two words, another way. That's physical. But I like to think that when they headed home, they were different than what they were when they got there. They went home another way. They went home knowing God and knowing the King and having witnessed that. They stayed with the task until it was finished, and because of that, they had a great impact upon the world. The year was 1983. In Australia, the long-distance foot race from Sydney to Melbourne was about to begin. 875 kilometers. That's about 500 miles about 150 world-class athletes had entered for what was planned to be a six-day event. And so the race officials were startled when a 61-year-old man comes up and he's dressed in overalls and galoshes that, galoshes that covered his boots. That's not running attire. And they, first of all, they refused to let him enter, but they finally said he could. So he explained to them, he said he had grown up on a 2,000-acre farm with thousands of sheep. Family could not afford horses or tractors. And so he would run. When storms came or dangers came, he would run sometimes several days to gather the sheep in, bring them to safety. Well, they let him run. And so they finally let him enter the race. And others, when the gun was sounded, they took off and left him in the dust. But he just jogged along in his boots and his... Galoshes. By the fifth day, oh, by the way, here's something. He didn't know you were supposed to stop every night and rest. And while they were stopping and resting, he just ran through the night, just kept going. And by the fifth day, he had caught them all, won the race, and became a national hero. He continued to compete in the long distance race till well up into his 70s. He was an inspiration to millions and a great encourager of young runners. In his honor and memory in 2004, the year after his death at age 81, the organizers of the race where he first gained fame permanently changed its name to the Cliff Young Australian Six-Day Race. Stay with it. These men completed the task. Three great character traits of these men. They were those who didn't allow their circumstances to impede their journey. They didn't allow their calling in life to disrupt their priorities. And then last of all, they had character traits that were illustrative of all great people of God. Wise men still seek Him. The question for us is, are we seeking Him like they did?